We are. Stuart we Tee. are live. Welcome to Soul Talk with Sahar. And I would like to welcome our viewers on Rhythms of Light and whoever watches us in the rebroadcast and also on our YouTube channel. Um, as you know, we started Bridges of Light to help connect all the light workers, all those who are interested in the spiritual evolution, to build bridges to shed some light so that soul journey is not as mysterious as one thinks. Tonight, my guest is Stewart Pierce. Stewart is a huge celebrity, so I'm very honored to have you. And um, some of you might not know him, so I would like to do the honor of introducing him. Stewart Pierce is the master of voice, a sound healer, an angel whisperer. His website is stewartpierce.com. He facilitates voice and presentation coaching, sound healing, soul readings. He's also an angelic facilitator, a seer, and an internationally renowned voice coach. He's held previously positions at the Shakespeare's Globe Theatre and the Drama Centre of London. He's the author of The Alchemy of Voice, a bestseller, and The Heart's Note. He has coached luminaries such as Eddie Redmayne, Matthew Good, Hugh Bonville. I mean, the list is endless, really, Stewart. Mini Driver, Vanessa Redgrave, Margaret Thatcher, Diana, Princess of Wales, and also the London 2012 Olympic bid. I'm just naming a few names. Um, I want to tell our viewers that you've published a lot of books. We've met really early on in about 2003. We, I started the magazine in 2004. I started podcasting maybe at that time and you were my first guest on the podcast. And I was just overcome with how down to earth you are. I mean, you immediately said, yes, you came to my flat. We got the mic, we fixed the sound vibration. And there we are, we did several interviews and to date they're the highest downloaded podcast. The one so um, I'm very happy to see you again and I'm very happy to connect with you again. I went through a very difficult and busy time. I got married, my brother got ill, my brother passed away, and then we moved to Dubai, then my mother got ill, she passed away, and I just came out of the tunnel and wow, you've written so many books and you have officially become an angelic emissary. Maybe we can begin by asking you, what is an angelic emissary? Well, it all really goes back to 30, is it 32, 32 years ago, during a very remarkable planetary emission. I'm getting a lot of feedback on this. Are you getting feedback? Yes, shall we maybe put the volume down? We put the volume, we put the volume down, is that better? I think so. Oops, that was something I meant to do earlier and I was waiting. Is that better? Um, hello, 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 hello. I can hear you well. I, I think it's slightly better, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, so it, was, it re really all began in 1987, um, which was preceded by the fact that my consciousness woke during 79, 80. And it woke because of something that rather similar to what you've just been through, in the sense that the whole of my career shifted in the late 70s from being an actor because my, I was told that I was living in the United States and working there as an actor. And yeah. my mother was dying. And so I came back to the UK and nursed her for a year. And then she left. We had a very, very powerful soul connection. So in her passing, I moved through this great rite of passage where she came to me. And it was almost as though my third eye just burst open in the latter part of 79. And so really for the beginning seven years of 1980, I worked on increasing the, the, my psyche, developing my psyche, I should say, and um, enhancing whatever my belief was in my mysticism and my belief in the fact that we're spiritual beings having a human experience and that we are all rich with soul. And what does that mean to be a soul container? Yes. And then uh, as I began to develop that as a psychic, as a mystic, but also having this career as a voice coach and working with Margaret Thatcher and blah, 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 
I was invited by a friend to um, Glastonbury during the harmonic convergence of August 15, 16, 17, 1987, which was a huge portal opening in the heavens. Yeah. I didn't know this. I mean, I was completely innocent. I just knew that I was going to have fun reading for people <laughs> in, this, in this crystal yeah. store in Glastonbury. And during the lunch break, I felt exhausted. So I went and sat on the tour, the high hill of Glastonbury, which for those people who are unfamiliar, is the heart chakra of the world. And during meditation, I heard these extraordinary sounds. I mean, these supernal sounds, the, the hallelujah chorus, as it were, but it wasn't sung as hallelujah. And I was so surprised, astonished, I opened my eyes and in front of me were these large orbs. Amazing. And I heard within my consciousness a voice that I remember from my childhood, from very, very young, which I believe is Archangel Michael saying, we are the angels of Atlantis and we give you a temple of sound healing that you will call the alchemy of voice. And so I really started to develop working on it, which is what the alchemy of voice was all about. Yes. When we met, I was really... Um, living the temple of the alchemy voice here in the city of London in the United Kingdom. Um, but I wasn't really coming out about the angels because I had this career as a voice coach. And then, it's slightly different today, but then people were still very circumspect about people who were, who were in positions of responsibility or in establishment positions who were mystics. That's right. So, yeah. you know, discretion is the better part of valor. When we last met in 2002, 2003, I wasn't really talking about it. No. But in 2010, I resigned all of my establishment positions. I left the drama schools where I was teaching. I resigned my position at Shakespeare's Globe. And that was all to do with the fact that the, 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 um, the hegemony, you know, the hierarchy of the institutes were being taken over by corrupt beings and I could no longer work with them. So I saw it as being a perfect opportunity yes. to come out of the closet and be a raging mystic. Yes, yes. Yeah. And so that's what happened. So really in 2010, 2011, when I met my present publisher, that he asked me if I would start really revealing. So we reprinted the Alchemy of Voice and put the soul back into it. Because as you know, it came out in 2005. But that publisher had asked me to extract the soul. They really wanted a book that was about celebrities. And I'm, I'm not prepared to, you know, dish, dish the dirt, as it were, <laughs> or talk about the private mechanisms of my, my, my clients' lives, many of whom I have discretionary uh, you know, agreements with, where I don't, don't expound on confidentiality. So that's really where it all began, you know? I totally agree with you, because when we centralize, you know, something it loses its core value and it's no longer really about awareness and spirituality. It's something else. And what I find interesting is that you've had a kind of a personal experience or a trauma that propelled, propelled you in the right direction. And I often found if you're really meant to do something, you'll be coerced into it, you know, whether it's the passing away of someone. What I have experienced is with the passing away of my father and then my brother, it's as if there's like an invisible force that helps guide you. And with every time, my intuition got stronger, my abilities were expanded. And it's interesting for me to see that you have experienced that too. Mm. Mm. Was it something, yes. the voice, was it something, I do remember, but for those of who don't know, was it something that you were born with, that since you were young, you had this ability to understand sound, vibration? Because I remember a time, when you were seeing sound. Mm. Can you tell Absolutely. us a bit about that? Because that's fascinating. Yeah, I mean, as a child, uh, I saw the multidimensional universe. So I saw beings of light, I, I saw angels, I saw ascended masters, mistresses, I saw ghosts. I was brought up, my father worked for the British royal family, so I was brought up in royal palaces, and they're very old and full of beautiful things. So there are many, 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 many voices. You know, yeah. voices that are historic voices that have gone on through the, you know, the annals of recorded history, so to speak. So I was very aware of all of this, and I spoke about what I saw, but I soon discovered that most people didn't know what I was talking about. I thought everybody saw what I was seeing, so yeah. I shut up. Um, and I had great difficulty learning, so I could not read because I was seeing sound. And um, I didn't read effectively until I was about 14, 15, and was numerically dyslexic. So, you know, this was all post-war, post-Second World War. 
And if children didn't read, or if they appeared to be stupid, the easiest thing was to beat them. So I was beaten thoroughly and traumatized by educators, which meant that I shut down. So I, I decided to self-mute for two years, around six, seven. My brother spoke for me. I have a brother who's a year older. And when we were babies, you know, when we were young ones, we were very, very, very close, often taken as twins. We have this soul connection. Yes. Um, and then, so he spoke for, for me. And, uh, and what it enabled me to do was to really listen and become aware of what human sound was. And then my mother had the ingenuity of when, you know, around nine, 10, well, actually 10, 11, to put us both into a church choir. Oh, lovely. And because I was always humming out of, whenever I was discovered, I would be humming, even though I wasn't speaking. I understand. And my mother thought, well, if, if he can hum, he can sing. <laughs> nice. Good on her. And I learned to read singing. In other words, I learned to read by being in flow. Amazing. Because the trauma of education disturbed the flow and moved me into this staccato, which was like this, because it was all about terror all the time. Because I couldn't do what they wanted. So I was always being hit with a stick as a child. And then I learned how to literally sing through flow. Breath is flow, music is flow. And I learned to read. That's where it really began. And then became aware of words. And I thought words were the most beautiful things that I'd heard. I will never forget. I must have been about six or seven. I just started, or let's say seven, eight. I just started speaking again. And I discovered the word insignificant. And I thought it was the most beautiful thing that I'd heard. Insignificant. Because for me, word, I eat words. That words anchor states. And that when we eat words, they become these extraordinary vessels of light within our consciousness. And I believe that's what language originally was, you know, that we shared on a heart level through the vowel sounds, because vowels are freely emitted passages of sound, whereas the intellectualization of our peoples today is very consonantal. Yes. Consonants such as b, d, g, z, so yes. they're stock sounds. Whereas vowels are very freely emitted passages of sound. And I was always, oh, you are, I was always singing like this. Yes. <laughs> Unusual child. And so, you know, then somebody said to me when my voice broke at the age of 11, there's something about your voice. And I thought, oh, there's something about my voice. Well, nobody said anything good to me about me, except there's something about my voice. Perhaps I should go there. So at, at high school, I went into the, you know, I joined the drama group or the theater group, whatever it was called. And um, somebody said, you should be an actor. And I thought, oh my goodness me, you know, I have to be an actor because this is, there's such glee and joy in the person's aura when they say this. And most people are looking at me and scorning me and scowling at me. So I thought, well, maybe I should become an actor. So I became an actor. And I was good at it. And I did that for about 10 years. So really then, what I hear you saying is that you were pretty much guided, although you were traumatized at school, you were led onto your path. And the thing that I became aware of and I really appreciate now is the sound and is the vibration. And I remember you telling me, just listen to where people are speaking from. Are they speaking from the heart? Are they speaking from the top of their head? Or are they speaking from lower down? And it's amazing what you can pick up if you listen. Mm -hmm. yes. And the second thing is that sound is wave, is vibration, which never really disappears, does it? Because you cannot destroy energy. So once you set the words, and I think you use that now quite a lot with your sacred trips to Luxor and things like that. I mean, I, and I don't know what the keys are about. I wanted to ask you about the keys but presumably you use the sound to open up the portals? Absolutely, absolutely. The sound is at the core of creation. And so sound is a key into consciousness and particularly into the preserving consciousness or the reserving consciousness that is held within certain form within, within our planet, particularly the ancient temples. So while there are unique fingerprints, there are unique snowflakes, there are also unique notes or sound notes that each of us have. So no two people on the planet can have the same vibration or the same sound note. 
Absolutely. And a big part of your work earlier on was to help people sound their true note or their heart note. Oh, which I still do. I still do. It's at the core of what I do. Because okay. if we're out of harmony, yes. then we have major challenges in our lives. If we are in harmony, we discover our personal sovereignty. And therefore, it's much easier to respond to the challenges as crisis equals opportunity, rather than reacting in, in defeatist or disempowering ways to the dramas of life. You know, where we give all of our power to it, rather than seeing, as we're saying, their initiations. That when challenge occurs, it's a huge initiation to take us inwards, to discover who we really are in terms of feeling is the language of the soul. So what am I feeling here? I'm feeling destitute. I'm feeling abandoned. Okay, so what is the opposite? How can we alchemicalize abandonment into acceptance? And thereby, we become the master mistresses of our own destiny because we start to shape the outer world in response or in coherence with the inner world, the inner world of paradise, which, of course, is full of love, full of joy, full of inclusivity, full of empathy, full of kindness, full of honesty, full of all of these virtues. You know, that, of course, when we look into the outside world today, we see a transition is needed Yes. Because so much of our world, particularly in terms of the governing structures of our world, through central government into corporatocracy, that we're seeing that many of the systems are run through ignominy and through, um, through um, treachery rather, and through corruption, rather than through kindness and through love. I'm working with a woman at the moment who's actually running for president in the United States of America. Wonderful. And her, and um, it's quite fascinating because I'm right at, the, right at the rock face of American democracy and how it needs to be redefined at this time so that the vision of the great founding fathers of the United States can pour forth. And what's interesting, which is why I mention them, is that, you know, all of the wisdom in these men, largely men because of patriarchalism, yes. created, I'm sure they were all had good women behind them. Yeah. Because all, all good men have good women behind them. Or today, good men behind them, yes. as we see, you yeah. know, with the burgeoning consciousness of sexual parity, that they all, all of their wisdom arose out of stillness. Stillness. They were, mostly, they were mostly Quakers or devout Christian believers who sat in silence together for long periods of time, an hour to an hour and a half, twice a day. So the, the act of the Constitution arose out of stillness. Really? I did it know arose that. out of the divine feminine. It rose out of what we call the meditative or the contemplative space, where we still ourselves and we go back to what is most essential, what is most quintessential about we human beings. In crisis, we do this. Hmm. Well, it's also about being clear about your intention. And I think maybe many people are not. Um, they do what they do. It feels to me like they're driven. They're taking advantage of an opportunity, but they're not connecting with the higher purpose of it or to what extent am I you know, doing that? So the first step is to awaken into our note and we do that through the heart. Is it by sounding a voice or is it? Well, finding our note means that we find the harmonic center of our range. Okay. You know, it seems to me that the whole of life is about examining the energies of life, physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. And once we've identified what the energy is, and we have experience of its capacity or its proportion, then we feel ourselves in relationship to it. And it ceases being intimidating or frightening or too big, too big, too big, you know. And that's one of the reasons I believe why we have a global village today, because we're realizing that the globe is actually uh, um, a, a, t uh, a terrain that we can all travel through. I mean, people are always saying to me, oh, by the way, where are you from? Because they can't identify, although I have a very British, British English voice because of training actors for many, many, many years who need to speak a lingua franca. Yeah. Um, and I say, well, I think I'm hovering 37,000 feet above the Atlantic because I'm based here and in the States. Um, and so, in other words, what I mean by that is that we are transversing terrains. We're becoming global identities. 
which means that we have a sense of proportion where we travel easily and with great mobility through the world. Right. And that seems to be increasing. Thereby, our consciousness expands. And thereby, as our consciousness expands, we have a way of being able to feel ourselves measuring to it or with it or for it, rather than being intimidated about what's going on on the outside. So, by, by finding our note, which is at the very center of our range, I mean, I'll give you an illustration of what I mean. But if my range is sitting here on a horizontal plane, rather like a, p a keyboard, yeah. like a piano, the most important thing about the piano, which incidentally is an instrument that stabilizes the whole of Western classical music, it's called the diatonic scale. In the middle, there is a note, which we call the middle C. Yes. And that divides the treble from the bass. So if I relate that to my voice, if I play with my right hand and my right hand alone, you get a lot of that. Uh, but of course, what suddenly happened is that I've stopped being who I am. I become something else. And if I carry on talking to you like this, you're probably going to get exhausted and say in a moment, yeah, could, you, you know, could you just calm down or release the stress? Because yeah. it's very stressful. If I go right down here like this. It's very heavy. <laughs> in the moment, you'll probably either fall asleep or be very, very concerned about my sanity or something. But if I play with both hands, you get a mixture of the treble and the bass together. It's more centered. Uh, that's my note. That's more centered. So if I take, if I take this and then make the horizontal vertical and put it into my spine, the middle is here. And so if words are out from the heart they enter the heart. If words arise from the tongue alone, they don't pass through our ears. It's literally that simple. But, you know, a lot of people become very confused when they hear, oh, you mean one note. And actually, yes, it is a note, which is a pit, which is a frequency. But the point is, when we sound a note in this part of the co cosmic nature, that the note always has a resonance attached yeah. to it. Yeah. And the resonance is the tone of our voices. So the note becomes a resonance. So in my one note, you can hear a multiplicitousness of sound. Um, so, so in many ways, to say one note, it is actually slightly misleading. But actually, at the same time, there is a sensation. So yeah. the way that I describe it, another way I describe it is if we imagine that we have a crystal here, and we shine the one light of the sun through it, we suddenly realize that that one light is made up of a number of rays, which in primary color sequence becomes red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, into ultraviolet, into infrared, and then red, orange, yellow, blue. So all of those notes, so to speak, or all of those colors are on different frequencies and are different notes. But what we're doing is shining the whole rainbow. Yes through our voices, if they're centered. And there's, there's such magic involved in this um, appreciation. Am I, am I right in saying or describing this process as in order to use your range, you need to be aware of what you're saying and pay attention to the words. Otherwise, you're just, <laughs> you know. Well, so. I mean, the point is that we're not, we're very rarely aware of the words that we use, you know, because people just open their mouths and, and whatever tumbles out of them. Yes. But what, what I'm suggesting is that we have awareness of our note. If we have awareness of where we position our voice, that we're breathing, which is, which is the inspiration of life, the pranayama of life. It is the very core of life. It's the very first thing that we did as we shot out of our mother's birth canals and were lifted from her belly was to go, <sighs> And incidentally, in most esoteric doctrines, there's a belief that that sound resonates throughout the cosmos forever, that initial note, that great roar of life. So if we're breathing and we're really feeling that our voices are sitting in the breath, in the middle of our beings, what happens is that we communicate with a majesty, with a stature, with a sovereignty, with magic, with a lure. It's the magnetic voice. Yes. So if we suddenly start doing that, I mean, people rarely take notice. I mean, we can try it on the children. The children, we're trying to discipline the children, we're doing this. They very rarely take notice. 
But if we come back into here and say, now stop what you're doing and listen, we need to create boundaries here. They automatically listen. Try it on dogs. You know, if you say, yeah. stop doing it, the dog carries on doing it. Animals but don't listen if you're yeah. yelling at them. Yeah, that's true. But it, you know, they're not understanding what we're saying. They're the feeling the vibration. Range, so this is the key. Forever, they're feeling, but it doesn't they're feeling the resonance, so they're feeling the vibration. And that's really what we're talking about. We're talking about this is a way of keying into the core elements of our vibrational field, physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. Yes. Because really what I'm trying to say is in order to be aware of that range and whether it's coming from the heart or not, you really need to, need to be grounded within yourself. You need to be all together. Otherwise, what you're saying is just coming out of your mouth and you're not even aware of what you're saying. Yeah. But once we slow down a little bit and we observe and we are aware of what we're saying, I think what I'm trying to say, we are able to better express ourselves. And I can tell from somebody's voice, you know, when a client calls to make an appointment, I, I can almost tell what their issue is and where they are at in terms of their awareness, you know, and whether they listen or observe or are they just, do -do 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 -do. <laughs> you know, so Many, you know, in, in ancient times, this was revered at the, at, to be at the core of life. I mean, for example, we go back into arguably the origins of Western civilization, which we refer to as being Rome and then Greece. We yes. know that there were ancient civilizations before that, the Sumerians, the, the Atlantean, the Sumerian. But in terms of the way that we address our consciousness today, academically speaking, Rome and Greece are considered to be the origins of Western civilization. Uh, and what, what's interesting is that civilizations rise and they fall. Our current civilization rose and is now falling and will become something else, a new paradigm. However, in Rome, what we're talking about is called persona. So they worked to find their persona. And but so that's how the word... The word persona in Latin means per through sona sound. Amazing. Which we use in the word personality, yes. which we use to describe the quality, the fabric, the essence of someone or the soul of someone. So we say his personality is really lovely. Her personality I wouldn't trust, you know. And we've summed the entire person up. But really what we're doing is talking about their voices. We're talking about their sound. Yeah. So they worked, the ancient ones worked on this, and they worked in three degrees. Gravity, gravitas, veritas, which means truth, yes. and integrity, which means integration oh, or integrity. Yes. Well, the only way that we can be full of integrity is if we're integrated. If we're, if we're balanced physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually, we are literally living through the wholeness of our kinesthesia. We're living through the wholeness of our consciousness, which is what you were meaning just now by, if we can literally become present, aware, breathe, and position our consciousness through speech, through our voices, we're onto something which is immensely powerful. Yes. Yes. Um, so if we go into the 19th century, a very famous British Prime Minister called Benjamin Disraeli said that the, the index of a man's character is his voice. Really? He said that? I haven't heard that quotation before. Interesting. If we go further back in the Elizabethan period, a Lord Mayor of London in 1597 said that all speech is decorated silence. <laughs> you can tell a man's character or a woman's character by their voice so you would listen as you were just saying I can listen into somebody and I know whether they're true or false and so for example the young man went to his beloved's father and asked for her hand in marriage the father would listen to his voice and if his voice was not in harmony, he would say, no, you will not have my daughter. Right, right. Well, in ancient Egypt, it was the heart. If it was weighed and it was light, then you go to heaven. And if it wasn't, and if it was a very heavy heart, then it was something else. 
Well, our moot would come and gobble it up. Yes, so for me, connection, you know, the sound, the heart being true. And, and you talk a little bit about that in the angels and keys to paradise. You talk about unlocking the Egyptian code to open the door to heaven. And I read a quote on the internet about your book that um, it's about exercises and meditations to further ascension. It will assist you to upgrade healing and freedom within your energy matrix using 12 essential keys that serve as cell codes. And um, this is really interesting because it brings it up to modern times. And you said it's like a powerful GPS to navigate um, through times of change. Can you expand a little bit on that? Well, this is a very, very ancient information that the Egyptians, which was really a colonization of Atlantis. So many of the great, the great priests, priestesses, who lived much longer lives than we do today, because they were living a 12 helix DNA, recolonized the world in the post times of Atlantis. And one major Atlantean priest wizard, who we know as Thoth, yes. Thoth, moved to Egypt, which was just beginning to evolve as a stabilizing nation within the middle, what we call the Middle East today, which was then called Mesopotamia. And uh, the, the, pre, the, the pharaohs, the kings, were men and women, pharaohs and queens, um, who knew that their birthright was anointed to appear as a priest of God, Ra, within the civilization. And the, the other priests would look after them in the great temples. And so their processes of initiation were called the Osirification process, mm -hmm. which we call the Kundalini arousal. Oh, I see. And there were a series of initiations through the Osirification process. Osiris was the great Lord God or the great King God, so to speak who brought about an element of creation. His wife was Isis, their son was Horus. And so the, the pharaohs worked on a series of initiations taught by the priests that are the keys to paradise. In other words, they prepared their physical vessel with intelligent thought and devotional rituals or prayers or chants to acquire greater light within their cells so that they could literally become the shining ones and then decide whether they would want to remain within human flesh or to literally ascend into paradise or as they called it, Pepe. And so the keys were given to me by a, a being that has been dead for three and a half thousand years who appeared to me in his tomb in Egypt. I've been going to Egypt for many, 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 many years and running retreats for the last 12. So in 2012, the high priest of I, who was the high priest of Akhenaten, right. and Nebuchadnezzar, and Tutankhamun, came to me in his tomb. A young guard transformed, shape-shifted into this old man, who I believe reincarnated as Gandhi. Oh, wow. Which gives it an indication of his wisdom and his ancient sage-like being. So he came to me and changed the whole of my life by blessing me and spelling me in a tongue which is not, in my experience, sounding like contemporary Arabic. It was a completely different sound, a very ancient Atlantean sound. Um, in, in situations that then arose post that, because that was in the middle of a ritual where I had 14 or 15, I think about 20 people standing around me who were people that were my, you know, my retreat people that I was on, on retreat with. And they were all very surprised by what they were experiencing. Um, there was a lot of hysteria. I mean, the story is all in the book, Angels and the Keys to Paradise. I then met a wisdom keeper who was a very powerful major in downtown Luxembourg. 
And he put a spell on me so that I was able to astrally travel into the necropolis, into the Valley of the Kings, and was shown extraordinary things. Oh, how fortunate. That are now being awakened. Wow. You know, yesterday, my guide, my Egyptian guide, sent me information about um, a huge chamber to Osiris that had been discovered. And it was one of the chambers, it hasn't been, it hasn't been this chamber has not been found until this time. So it, the doors are being opened after 4,000 years. Would you be visiting that in December? Oh, in December, I will be there. Absolutely, I will be there. I okay. spent three weeks there at the end of this year. So I will, you know, there will be the 12 day retreat which if anybody's listening and wants to come, please contact me at stuart at stuartpierce.com. And, you know, there are one, just one or two places left. But yes, I mean, you know, post-retreat, we will be, I will be going there because I spend extra time there over Christmas. And um, my guide and I will be going to investigate what it's all about. Oh, that's so funny. the keys are literally ways of being able to become better people. Yeah. Yeah, to increase your vibration, to open up to the light, as you said, and, and that's basically the ascension. To live love is the only impulse. Nice. Love is all there is. Nice. And therefore we rebalance the ego. That's interesting. So I guess... What's this also interesting is yeah. that the book, the book was printed successfully and uh, published. And within two months, it was sold out. Oh, fantastic. Well done. But my publisher refused to reprint it. So I now have the rights. You bought the rights. Um, I have the rights because it's, it's no longer on sale. I mean, if you go to Amazon, you can buy it for $115 or something if you yeah. want to. It seems to me that's rather foolish because originally it was priced at um, $18, you know. Uh, so, but I have it on PDF, so if anybody wants to acquire it, all they have to do is email me and I can send them the book and they can be transformed. Uh, what's interesting is that each of the 12 angels of Atlantis overlight each chapter. And so each chapter begins with an icon. Oh, yes. This is Michael, the cosmic leader. And what's interesting about these icons is that this is the orb of Michael. And if I bring it very close to the camera, you can see within the orb is a sigil. Yes. And these the angels gave me, there are 12 sigils. A sigil is an ancient symbol that contains the, the entity, the soul of the entity. So this is the heart of Michael. Oh, I see. Okay. And so many, many people who have been initiated into the, the angels of Atlantis, they're using these sigils and their lives are completely changing. This is, this is Zadkiel, the divine comforter. Interesting. The, the orb of Zadkiel, the divine comforter. And here is the sigil. And they're very, they're very similar to Egyptian hieroglyphics. So There's by looking at them, you, you connect with a certain energy or how does it work? It's what, sorry? By, by looking at these sigils or symbols, something happens, you're transformed, you're... Yeah. Well, you know, many, many people are so there using... Are of them? Is that, is that it? Let me just... There is also an oracle, the okay. oracle, Angel Heart Sigils. So the, the, I have it over there on another bookshelf, so I won't disturb our conversation by reaching for it. But if this, if this were a card with a sigil on it, people are literally doing this. Oh, I see. And they're feeling immense energies moving through them and healing challenges. Um, or they're tracing the sigil with their fingers okay. and then tracing it on their hearts. Okay. That they're meditating and feeling then that having meditated on one particular symbol, there are only 12 angels or 12 symbols, but that night they dream a symbol but the angel comes to them and reveals a certain secret, a certain vision, a certain oracular counsel about their lives that answers a question or reveals to them the next step of their path. What a wonderful way to connect. That's fantastic. So the deck of cards is separate from the book. Yeah. Okay. The, the deck of cards, the oracle, the angel heart sigils. 
Um, so, so yes, yeah, so it's, as you can hear, it's, um, it's a quite a complex feast, but at the same time, I write it very, very, um, very reasonably and very comprehensively to allow people an understanding. If I just quote from the book, just one small section, you see angels live to feel, whereas human beings live to know. Angels do not need schooling as humans do, for they know the essence of everything through their highly electrified intuition. You see, intuition is the soul of great thinking. Intuition is the superhighway that carries the angel's distinct magic. Intuition sounds like the laughter of a bubbling brook or the gurgling of a baby or the wind moving through the trees or the inspiration of lovers sweetly loving. And then it goes on. It addresses compound forms that we're using. There are many meditations, there are many prayers, there are many extrasensory perceptions. Wonderful, wonderful. Can, I, can, I, can we move to talking about Diana? Because I am eagerly waiting for your book to be out. And I think it's out next year, 2020, am I right? Yes. January the 10th, 2020. Oh, fantastic. Mm. How did that come about? Because obviously you've met Princess Diana, you've worked with her, but then she came to you after she crossed over? Yes, three years ago, I was with my agent, my literary agent, who's become a very dear friend. And uh, we were talking in guarantee. And at that time, I had another book that was proposed to a major publisher called Angelic Activism. And um, the, pu the publishers called us during the meeting and said, oh, does Stuart have to write another book about angels? Doesn't he have something else to write about? We have so many books about angels. Whereas I remember 30 years ago, they were crying out for books about angels anyway. Um, so everybody's writing about angels, apparently. And suddenly, Diana was standing next to us. How amazing. Diana and I were very close during the last two years of her, her life. We didn't know it was the last two years of her life, but yes. right, the last two years. that's when I worked with her. And our relationship was completely clandestine because of the circus that was, existed around her. And I didn't want to get involved with the paparazzi. Um, and, you know, people like, people like us that had helped her. And then they'd gone to the daily newspapers and made lots and lots of money out of ditching. Yes secrets about Diana and I swore that I would never ever ever do this because she was sacred she was a sacred vessel um extraordinary so she said I want you to write about the work you did because you took me through a series of very powerful initiations which allowed me to develop my radio and then I sat down and started thinking about the level of consciousness that we engaged in before you and I met, before the globe, the Shakespeare's globe opened. So this would have been 95, 96, 97. And I realized that I'd written a lot of notes in my journal. And so what I did was write this book and interview people that we, that we had known at that time for their comments on Diana, where people were revealing extraordinary things about Diana within the context of our consciousness today, these 22 years later. It's very astonishing that she was actually before her time. And we saw that she was a great change maker within British establishment, particularly within the royal family. But they just didn't understand her acute sensitivity. And so part of my job was to help her stabilize, to ground, to yeah. earth herself. So she could become this channel of light yeah. and to experience this love that changed everybody's lives, particularly during her death, during her dying process, which was a ritual initiation. So it was a killing, she was killed. But at the same time, um, her soul had agreed to move through this transition and become an angel of vast luminosity that is with us today as the queen of everybody's hearts. So I see her in the pantheon of the divine family, with Mary, with Isis, with Magdalene, with Kuan Yin, with Portia, with Sophia. She is there bringing about the great revolution of consciousness 
that we are allowing to filter through us with the wisdom of love. Yes. Yes. So the book is really a, a, a compilation of um, for the first chapter is talking about what was that all about? What was this phenomenon called Diana? And wh why did she die in the way that she died? And what happened? Because you know where she died in Roman times was the Temple of Diana. Oh, really? So it's a very sacred, it's a sacred portal that goes back in the sands of time. So I trace this all the way back to the Merovingians and the Spencer family are the, one of the oldest noble lineages in the Anglo-Saxon yes. line of the aristocracy, much more noble than the Saxe Coburgs, who are called Windsor, yes. much more noble than the Queen. Yeah. Interestingly, you know that it goes all the way back, and they fought duels at that point because they also worshipped Diana. Interesting. Anyway, so I, I answer the unanswerable and I question the unquestionable. And then we go into the exercises that empowered her so that she could become what everybody saw her as being, which was this radiant being of walking love. I see that you've carried on along that theme because you've done a lot of work with women this year and past year and empowering women. And how, how did that go? How do you feel it has impacted women? Oh, it's extraordinary. Women are coming to me from all over, the, all over the world to take part in, the book is called Diana, The Voice of Change. The yes. project is called The Voice of Change. And The Voice of Change is the voice of love. And so many women are coming to explore why they are experiencing such disempowerment in relation to the men and how they can acquire a power within them energetically so physiologically a power that allows them to remain central in the face of the criticism. And as a result of that, the men's power is automatically altered. So the women are seen in a different light. So therefore I say, look at Marianne Williamson and what she is doing as she runs for the presidency of the United States. Look at Jacinta Ardern, who is the prime minister of New Zealand. Um, one of my clients at the moment is this, is this extraordinary woman who is one of the world's leading economists, who is just about to be voted as president of the World Economic Forum. Amazing. These women are bringing about radical change. So the process of healing, or if healing is a movement back to wholeness, this process of healing that they're moving through is a radical journey in terms of finding their voices so that they can speak their truth, speak their power, and live the lives of ordained beauty that they wish to live rather than constantly being disempowered by the men. I think you're right, but I think a big part of, for women feeling disempowered is just really allowing it to happen. Do you know what I mean? I mean, I lived with very supportive males in the family, so nobody tried to disempower anybody. But to a greater extent, I think we invite stuff maybe to push us into owning and claiming who we are. For me, I see through my clients, a big part of it is just owning who they are rather than creating a war and conflict between men and women. So a lot of my um, female friends now would say, oh, I want to be in the feminine. And I said, you know, but we have both. We have feminine and masculine and you need both energies. But if we talk about people, you need to know who you are before you know what you want. And you need to really be aware of your intention and really anchored in the heart that you don't have an ulterior or, or maybe a lower motive. And that I think applies for men and women. But when we allow a program to go on without interrupting it, you know what I saw also in the corporate world is a lot of women would not support other women. <laughs> so we need to get our act together, you know? And uh, from my observation, you know, and, and knowledge of history over the years, if the civilization or the culture supports women, then it is a strong um, democratic culture. I mean, look at our history in England. We had the greatest time of enlightenment under women ruler, Elizabeth I, Bodica, you know, Victoria. <laughs> it brings a lot of stability. I think you're quite rightly also said that they need to have 
women, uh, men who empower them and support them in doing so. So I, I wouldn't want anybody to get the idea that, you know, we're supporting women and not supporting men. I think both should be together and both are needed in order for both halves to fulfill their purpose. Do you agree? Well, I, I totally agree with everything you've said. But you see that the core of what you're sharing is that the only way to really know self yes. is if the yin and the yang, the male and the female, are balanced. Yes, absolutely. But women can't do this if they are oppressed. Yep. The point is that most women feel oppressed by the patriarchy. But the whole, the whole of the patriarchy, patriarchal establishment is that the men rule. And so now this is shifting so that we're coming into a balance. And in order to really know self, therefore, it's not a question of being imbalanced either way. It's a question of being in harmony between the male and the female, between thought and feeling, between the outer and the inner, between the head and the heart, between the strength and the courage that it takes to move forward, balanced with the inner degree of stillness and love and compassion and empathy. All you have to do is look at politics in the moment, and you can see that women are changing. The next chapter of history is written by the women and the girls, not by the men. Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's a core what I'm talking about. But I'm saying a big part of it as a human being to live in your essence is by working on yourself and kind of preparing yourself to be up for that role. And maybe... There's, there is nothing else. There yeah. is nothing else. Yeah. Thine own self be true. Yeah. And most of the time, we're giving our power away. I mean, you know, as a, as, a, as a counsel, as a healer, you know that most people, when they come to you, they're in severe challenge. But when you ask them to talk about what the challenge is, they can't. They don't know. They just know that they're feeling like shit, but they don't know what shit is. And I feel that part of what we're doing is that we're allowing people to really know what their feelings are. The feeling is the language of the soul. So we're developing feeling literacy. Yeah. So that people can understand, well, I'm feeling this. As soon as we've identified something, as soon as we've named it, we have power over it. Yeah. Because we can transform it into its opposite. So if we're experiencing supreme abandonment, but if we transform it into acceptance, we no longer feel the loneliness and the disdain of abandonment. We feel accepted and automatically our social skills begin to improve and then suddenly people come out of the ether to meet us in a very remarkable way when the, when the master when the student is ready the masters come absolutely absolutely no but my point is that women can do a lot to empower other women and very often i found women in the corporate world they develop certain skills but they're unable to transfer these into their personal life so they can run a corporation but they don't know how to apply the same in their personal life and they feel rather whatever um handicapped oppressed or whatever it is the whole picture is changing because i think universally we're coming more into balance we're coming more into our hearts um the old paradigm of push and greed and force and conflict really is beginning to crumble and i think the whole humanity is going through this you know it's not just about men and women what i'm trying to say is there's nothing well, men and women make up humanity. But you see the, the, the schisms that you're talking about and the way that often women have been have moved, maneuver themselves into positions of leadership but have become very male, have yeah. become alpha women, and therefore um, disturb their sisterhood. That they're doing this because they've been taught to do it by the men. Yeah. And now what's happening is that there's a revolution taking place. There are new styles of leadership coming forward where there is greater emotional intelligence. And that's why I mentioned, for example, that the voice of change is the voice of love. So wherever I'm going, I'm working, you know, I've just come back from a tour of the United States, where in Seattle, for example, and in Northern California, I ran retreats. And uh, the people that were attending were Silicon Valley people. So we're talking about the people who are involved, uh, the, the higher echelons of the technological revolution on our planet. Yes. And what they're all doing, they're all, they're all really cerebral. So they're all here the whole time. And what they're trying to find is the truth of what I'm sharing with them. And so when I transform their energetic state physiologically, they were absolutely, wow. 
that was amazing because when a human being finds their note and they sound it, it's a magic witnessing. And therefore we move back into balance. Anyway, so what we're answering are all of these varying degrees that have become imbalanced which is why our world, wherever we look, is going through great challenge to bring it back into balance. And one of the ways of doing it is by examining the yin, yang, male, female within ourselves, to thine own self be true. It's the only way that we can move forward. Gandhi said, know thyself. Yes. And um, begin, begin by changing yourself, you know, be the change you want to see. Absolutely, absolutely. And then that changes. I was, you know, men asking for sexual favors. I think I'm trying to make a subtler point that personally, I never saw men as men and women as women. I was completely oblivious to it. I saw people as people. And I think if you begin to identify uh, yourself with a certain identity, then the other one is not you and that brings a conflict. But if you see people as people and you understand them as people, it shouldn't really matter whether they're men or women. Because sometimes men, women do the same thing when they're in a certain position. And sometimes okay. men are extremely supportive. But I'm saying we can transcend all of that by beginning to just see people as people rather than relate to them, you know, you're either with me or against me, because that's the thing that created the whole conflict. You know, well, if we're, if, if, no, no, I'm so, yeah. what I'm sharing with you is what people bring to me when they're in a state of disharmony. And my job is to help them see how to create harmony. In order to do this, we see that our consciousness is suspended within a quality of vibration, which yeah. is called duality. I'm not here, is, here, is the, yeah. here is the left brain, here is the right brain. Here is the male brain, here is the female brain. And if we begin to literally find capacity in these realities, we find a way of coming back into the sacred balance which was known as the axis mundi and the anima mundi. They play through it. And we become remarkable human beings. Absolutely. So all of my work is about that, of living the highest vision of ourselves, not the lowest vision. The lowest vision is when we operate through conflict. The highest vision is when we operate through harmony. Yes. No, I this has been a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stuart Pierce, and hopefully we'll have another chance of speaking again. Thank you very much. For Bless you. Here. Have a wonderful day, Sahar, and much love to you. Take care. And love great you. love to all of our listeners. Thank you for watching, and we hope to see you soon again. Bye.